Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. I'm John Miglosh for the Wisconsin DMA and the International Society for Strategic Marketing. Okay, we got a couple of weird things to look at today. The first thing I wanted to look at probably won't even come up, but that's okay. So this morning on Scott Adams, and if you don't follow Scott Adams on Periscope, I highly recommend that you do. <clears throat> he always starts the morning off with a simultaneous sip, which I'll, ha I'll do today. But the interesting part today was that he started without reading it off a script. Now, I'm going to read it because I don't have it memorized. But he hasn't had it memorized, and he's been doing it for years. He said he can read it for thousands of times and still doesn't stick. And here's how it goes. All you need is a cup or a mug or a glass, a tankard, chalice or stein, canteen, jug or flask, a vessel of any kind. Choose your favorite beverage. I like coffee. So then we sip. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> he's never been able to do it without reading it off. And yesterday, someone sent him a package in the mail. This is why I wanted to mention it. And in there were assorted items, just oddball little items. <laughs> and he took them out and handled them and looked at them. And then he realized that they were all the items in his little poem that he starts every day with. And he put them in order, and he handled them, and he looked at them in the physical world. And today, for the first time ever, he was able to say, a cup or a mug or a glass, a tank or chalice or stein, a canteen, jug or flask, a vessel of any kind. What does that show you? Well, for one thing, it shows what I've been saying the neuroscience is clear. Your brain has 10 times more touch receptors than visual receptors. Your brain has a whole strip of sensors that are worried about getting burned or getting bit or eaten or falling down or a lot of things, right? I noticed after my hip surgery that my putting was way off, and it's because my legs have been a different length. And my body, you don't realize this when you're putting. You think, oh, I'm just swinging the club. Your body is sensing whether it's uphill or downhill by the way, you're, the way your legs go. Every putt seemed felt like it was downhill. There's a lot going on in your body that you don't know about. And touch is 10 times more significant than vision. Now, Scott went on to say, oh, yeah, so we can have school and we can have, uh, you know, virtual reality glasses and the kids can visualize these items. And it might work. But it's not as powerful as what you did, Scott. It's not as powerful as touching those items. A cup, mug, or a glass. A tankard, chalice, or stein. A canteen, jug, or flask. A vessel of any kind. That's powerful. That's what direct mail brings to the table. Nothing else does. Nothing else does. You want engagement? And with engagement, we have a labeled data set. That's the key. You take away the engagement and the guarantee of engagement, and you have no labeled data set. It's very difficult. I'm working on that, working on a patent for digital, but it's, it's not going to be the same. It's not going to work, not as, not as well but it'll give the digital people something to chew on. Okay, moving on. Big news, big news, big news, right? Let's go, let's figure out how to push the buttons here. Okay, let's go over here. Well, you may not have heard this in the mainstream media, but Trump puts himself, is, is planning an executive order to put himself on all postage stamps, forcing the Democrats to push for abolishing USPS. not no it's not true this is the babylon b but since it was postal i thought it was pretty funny <laughs> some of you will not think it's funny it's going to be my visual today i think uh sources are reporting that trump has dealt a killer blow in his ongoing war against his sworn enemy the u.s postal office it's not true i watched a press conference he said he doesn't have any problem with the postal service he just doesn't think it's 
the time is right to, to mandate vote by mail, which is right, and we need to restructure the agreements and things. And my postman, I've been talking to Grant, my postman, and I, and I said, you know, what do you think of all this? And he said, well, the Postal Service is a service. <clears throat> it's not a business. And I think that's a really great perspective. I think Grant cut to the chase in this whole issue. The Postal Service is the last mile service. And the last service that most little towns get. Okay? You say, well, they got a wire, they got the internet. Yeah, but it's not the same, as we just pointed out from Scott Adams. Uh, he's the creator of Dilbert, by the way. In a move of sheer mind-blowing <laughs> mind brilliance, Trump directed the post office to put his face on every single stamp, forcing the Democrats to reverse course and abolish the institution once and for all. <laughs> you know, and, and when I was giving my talk on why mail, one of my friends who happened to be running for governor in the state of Wisconsin said, why don't we abolish the Postal Service? You just don't realize how much it's doing. It's like your body. <laughs> you think you can be totally virtual? No. The new stamp dubbed the Trump stamp used to be used on all pieces of mail features a smiling Donald Trump with the caption, greatest president ever. Don Lemon broke the news in a tearful address to the nation last night. Our democracy is over, he said. It doesn't exist anymore. I will never send another piece of mail ever again, and neither should you, or else you're racist. Antifa and BLM responded by marching on local post offices, bringing them down. Enthusiastic Trump supporters bought up all the stamps, which are now selling for $3,000 a piece on eBay. Uh, this is a Babylon Bee, and uh, if you don't subscribe to Babylon Bee, or at least check it out now and then, you should. Because often there's a lot of truth in it, and uh, there's a lot of manipulation and fun that goes on in politics, and they seem to point it out as well or better than anyone. But note that it's sarcasm, and this hasn't happened yet. So let's go on. Payless returns to the North American mar market. I thought I would get some more good news in here besides the post office, and I think I'm going to deep dive into postal and mail by mail or vote by mail and some stuff tomorrow i'm gonna call my friend keith who prints the ballots for the city of phoenix and has some definite thoughts on the matter uh plus he's canadian so that means anything he says is okay with me <laughs> hey there <laughs> that's kind of wisconsin talk actually but wisconsin is like you can see canada from here <laughs> it's a long ways from canada <laughs> anyway uh <laughs> 2,000 stores. They shuttered 2,000 stores in early 2019. Shut them all down. 2,000. They're planning to bring back 300 to 400 standalone stores over the next three years. And um, beginning with a store in Miami. Now, here's the take. And this is really interesting. They filed for Chapter 11 less than two years after emerging from bankruptcy. At the time, the retailer struggled with heavy financial debt burden, and its e-commerce site wasn't productive even as many consumers were switching to online in 2019. But what they said, and this I think is worth thinking about, now more than ever, Americans need value and discount items. You know, they knew that they had a track record that was good in downturns, and with the economy booming, eh, well, maybe we can afford to buy the Gucci shoes, you know, for $1,700 or something. Well, now the Gucci stores have been looted and people still need shoes. So they're coming back fast as ever. And I think it's a really great move. And I just, and it's a, it's a sign that, you know, retail is a, is a, is a rolling wheel. There's some things that work better in recession. There's some things that work better in boom times. And, you know, the buildings are still there. They might be all empty at the moment, but that brings opportunity. I've always admired the Chinese restaurant business model, which is find a restaurant that just went out of business and make a big make a deal with the with the landlord for low rent, put up some knickknacks on the walls, and get your kids to work there. You can't fail at that. You may not get rich, but you it won't ever fail it's it's you know so many people i talk to oh my dream is to open a restaurant well, what kind of restaurant would, would you like well i'm thinking french barbecue indian or something you know 
some combination that's never been, not only never been tried before, but no one would ever know what to think and probably doesn't want to come. <laughs> On the other hand, if you go with a, with a, you know, here's good food. You know, every little town has a cafe and Heartland has two or three and they're great. You know, they don't go out of business. The boutiques mostly do. So Payless is not a boutique. It's a down home. And as I reported, I'd like to hear an update on this, but Dollar Store was uh, opening a whole bunch of new, new stores this year, even before uh, the COVID-19. And um, we're getting some regular business good news. Uh, unemployment rates lower than anticipated, much lower than was anticipated by analysts. Initial jobless claims fell below 1 million for the first time in, since March. Uh, June, consumer spending, the anchor of the economy jumped by 5.6% following 8.5 in May. Durable goods rose 15.1% in May and 7.3 in June. Now, that's coming off nothing. But still, um, the PMI index is over 50%. Many printers echo this sentiment. And <clears throat> here is the print news. This is the March, April, May, or something like that. And this is March and April, May and June. So May and June. So here's the quotation activity. Here's the sales, production, work on hand, quotes. So things are looking up for printers. Uh, thank heaven. Okay, now, what I wanted to end with is how CMOs can build strong relationships with the CFO and why they should. David Dodd. And... Uh, According to the B2B Institute, uh, did a report, and they said you need to develop measurement systems that will, the two things to get better relationships with your CFO. One is they need to develop measurement systems that will accurately capture the value of the marketing process. And two, communicate that value. I would say two is very redundant. Because if you actually could measure marketing and you could quantify it well, that word will get around on its own. The problem is most marketers don't like accountability. You've heard me tell the story of when I was at the ad agency and the ad agency I worked at was famous for branding and beautiful ads. And I've even shown you some examples of the Dominic's campaign that beat back Cub Foods. Wonderful. But anyway, so I liked it for that. And, but they liked me because I talked about accountable advertising. And we did five pitches over the couple of years I was there and we won five out of five, which is like unheard of in the ad business. And in every case, the president, CFO, CEO, whoever was there from senior management said, we liked the guy who said we could have accountable advertising. Anyway, then came the first meeting. We always had a meeting, kickoff meeting with the, uh, with the ad manager of the client and the creative director and all the creative team and all that. I never got invited, not to one. And they had great snacks. They always had it like catered. It was really great. And uh, nothing. So finally, I asked our creative director, what was up? Why didn't I get to come? And they said, well, first of all, your portfolio is ugly. We don't want you ever talking about how you beat the control or, you know, because what you did was mainly ugly up something that looked pretty good. We might have beat the control, too, if you would have let us, but we weren't involved with those clients of yours. So anyway, the second thing he said was, you talk about accountability. You talk about testing. We don't want that. We want to win awards. We want people to look at our ads and say, wow, that's great. Do we really want to know how great it does? The great impact? No. Because if it doesn't have a great impact, we don't want to know. It'll be harder to, to, <laughs> to win the award. So we just don't want you around. <laughs> and so I quit and founded my own agency. <laughs> And we had our 30th anniversary, so we've all succeeded, and they did, they've done well, too. But the point is, is that advertising and marketing, for the most part, don't want accountability. They want to do beautiful things and win awards. And the ad manager from the client did, too. Once the president was out of the room, there was no worries about accountability. But, anyway... Why should you even care about the CFO? Well, first of all, they have an important role in determining marketing budgets. 
and they can cut things pretty much without anybody's <laughs> extra permission. And so you probably, 50% or something of marketing budgets are, are cut right now, okay? Second, there's no connection between the revenue at the top of the P&L and the advertising expense. There's no little red line that says, oh yeah, and we know for sure that this connected to that, that this caused that that the marketing down here caused increased revenue. It rarely happens. And if it does, it's probably accidental, right? Like the Will It Blend story, which I highly recommend you look up. Okay, so here's how you communicate. First is the value. The value framework has five components, V-A-L-U-E, value. The CMO and other marketers must have a clear understanding of how, of how it should be. Value is created within their company. You buy a machine, you save labor, you increase throughput, you understand how you lower your costs per unit, and that increases profit. Lower your costs sell the same number, you make more money at the end of the day. How does marketing do that? Well, for most CFOs, marketing does that by cutting the marketing budget, just period. You know, when I was working with Adobe, we took their circulation from 500,000 to a million in about six months. We found a whole raft of other stuff we could, we could mine with the modeling. And we worked out a way to do it with much, much, much greater efficiency. So we took a company valued at 25, or annualized sales of 25 million and bumped them up to 50 million. And actually the revenue per piece, no, the margin per piece went up something like 74%, including the increase. So it was probably even more than that, than that. But you know, that was what they told us at the time. So that's big numbers. Well, the Asian crisis hit, and Adobe had actually confirmed the decision to give us their entire direct mail budget, uh, which would have paid us, just us, for managing the, all the machine learning and everything, uh, about 250000 a month, or close to 300000 a month, which is real money. And we, uh, at the same time, the Asian crisis hit, and they, and they cut all marketing in half. And the guys who ran uh, Image Club Graphics said to them, why would you cut when every dollar we spend returns like 10? They said, it doesn't matter. We're not going to let a, a couple million dollar division dictate this policy. The CFO just did that. Okay. So there is no necessary connection except that marketing is viewed as an expense item. Okay. Accountability. CMOs should proactively and expressly accept accountability for those aspects of revenue growth and profitability that marketing can influence. You know the trouble with this? Their compensation package probably isn't very well connected. No. You know, they, they, they got the title CMO. Wow, that's a big deal. So we're, now we're making 300000 500000 a month. I mean, not a month, a year. And we get big numbers. Do you really want accountability? What if, what if the big idea you have fails? You're out. Few people really want accountability, especially in marketing, because it's tricky. It's tricky. Unless you're kind of a born and bred direct marketer, that's not what you're looking for. Okay? So accountability is nice to talk about. If you want to talk to your CFO about it, you should. But you probably don't want to because the CFO would love to hold marketing accountable for a change, would love that. You know, so many companies that created the CMO position, you know, after the CMO started talking in the board meetings, everybody would roll their eyes and say, you know, well, let's make this guy a VP of marketing instead, or this gal. <laughs> let's, let's cycle this out. And you know, that stuff happens <laughs> outside the board meetings usually. The CMO should avoid the use of marketing jargon. What is marketing jargon about? It's about the next great thing that we're going to do with 
techno AI machine learning. But it but without the accountability, it's just more spending that we can't understand or track. And as you've heard from me, 87% of AI projects never get to never get to ROI. Why does that matter? That's this is it right here. This is it. This is it. There's no evidence. Without accountability, you have no case. There's no evidence. There's no measurement system that will accurately reflect the value that marketing creates. I would say marketing does more to undermine that in most cases, unless you're a direct marketer. And then you understand that it's a heuristic system, a self-learning system, a, a, a system that ultimately teaches you what to do next. It's a great value. It's much better than somebody coming in with their gut feel. So anyway, <clears throat> I don't expect this to happen anytime soon, but if you'd like help with it, find an old direct marketer and they can institute a program. It doesn't have to be your whole marketing. You know, the Lovesack case, which I was going to do yesterday, uh, but you can get it. It's out and about on my YouTube channel. Um, that case study is great because it was done with a VP of marketing that had never experienced direct marketing, never really seen the accountability as possible. And by the end, the CEO and founder says, these guys do a great job of measuring the marketing spend and putting the money where it does the most good. That's all you need. Work on that. I'm John Miglosh. Have a great day. Like and share. Your friends will know you're smart. Bye-bye. <laughs>